All right, welcome to the uh, first lecture in Metallurgy Fundamentals uh, here in the ENGT 200 class at Richland Community College. Uh, as I go through, Chapter 1 uh, here is about the history of metallurgy. And I will be uh, uh, remiss to tell you that uh, over the years, as far as my own work experience when I'm, I'm teaching courses or even when I'm uh, in industry itself and working, um, I've often kind of wondered about how important discussions on the historical aspects of what we do in uh, the trades, um, how much it's really important. Uh, usually I kind of consider this a little bit just uh, trivia um, and some academic uh, grandstanding in some cases as far as to discuss the historical context of of where the trades are at at the moment. And certainly I don't know at this point how much it really relates to um, what we are physically needing to be able to do in the trades. Um, but uh, as I go through, I will kind of point out some highlights. So I, I have kind of changed my opinions over the years on some of this. And certainly in the last 10 years, there's been a, a resurgence of... Um, people wanting to learn how to forge and and uh, actually doing forging so that there is some benefit um, here to learning some of this information in terms of the historical context of metallurgy and that's kind of what chapter one is all about so I don't really expect you to uh, understand and know uh, everything I'll kind of um, talk about some of the high points as we go just so that you can be aware of it so um, so you can look and read through the learning objectives that are here in the slides and of course in the textbook as well as you go through it so I'm not going to take the moment to kind of review these for you but you can kind of uh, do that on your own time so now I will kind of mention as we go through just understand some of the differences here between Stone Age Bronze Age and the Iron Age um, as far as the advent, um, and remember that bronze came before iron uh, as we kind of look through this. Of course, you all know if you think about primitive cavemen or, or the Stone Age itself where uh, we were basically picking up rocks and throwing rocks at each other. We might uh, uh, use flint to fashion arrowheads and, and so forth, um, depending on which geographical location mankind was at the time. Um, and of course, if you think about uh, minerals and uh, rocks like feldspar and, and obsidian and some of the other types of materials that uh, arrowheads were made out of or have been made uh, out of, they tended to be hard and oftentimes brittle. A lot of times you'd basically be banging other rocks against them to kind of get them to break and hope that you'd get a sharp edge. And that's kind of where things were at at Stone Age. Now that did, did develop so um, as we went and uh, as we get into the start of metallurgy, the main thing here for you to understand, of course, is that uh, we are basically extracting these metals from the earth's core. So uh, what we call ore, so different types of rock and ore and uh, alloying here as we go is a process of uh, taking different types of metal, uh, combining them together to achieve desired properties. Uh, and that's really kind of what the, the science and practice of metallurgy is all about. It's kind of providing different combinations of these different types of uh, metals. Copper and gold were the first metals that were used. You have probably all been in a museum at some t time where you have seen uh, some of these ancient uh, artifacts. Of course, gold has always been traded traded and valued as a commodity uh, that had uh, value to it um, and it was shaped in terms of jewelry. Uh, kings in the olden days also oftentimes would express their uh, significance and how important they were by the amount of gold that they had in their uh, treasury. Um, as well and uh, one of the reasons why copper and gold were first uh, used is because they were very malleable so they were able to be hammered or forged into these useful shapes and, and tools that we went so the bronze age started and when we're talking about bronze one of the things that you do want to remember is that bronze is both copper and tin melted together um, we began to smelt uh, that bronze. So that's a process. When we talk about smelting, it's a process of extracting metal from its ore. 
uh, and breaking it down. So we talk about alloying, which is combining different metals or metals and non-metals together. When we got to the Bronze Age, it was discovered when you mixed copper and tin, the result uh, of bronze was actually stronger than copper by itself. So now I've often wondered to myself, how was that actually uh, discovered and who was the people who kind of figured this out that these two materials came about? But um, that's a question for the historians to kind of delve into and figure out. Cast bronze, we also started to realize that once we uh, melted this metal down, uh, we could pour it. And uh, sand molds uh, were op what we refer to as an open face sand mold. This is one of the very first methods of casting. Now, if you uh, have taken the um, manufacturing processes class, you've probably uh, seen demonstration. Uh, last semester, I did do a demonstration where we melted some aluminum and poured it into a sand mold or sand cast mold, uh, basically the same type of thing uh, there as we go. So um, you could produce intricate shapes, So, but it's basically pressing forms into the mold uh, that's required um, and then just pouring that molten material into it. So large blocks called ingots cast, um, and they would kind of start out... Uh, and develop these ingots, ingots first, and then they would work, rework those into different shapes. Uh, they became a trade or a commodity that got traded from one region to another, especially in those areas that didn't really have tin. So in, in the lab, there is a uh, map up on the wall that kind of shows different geographical areas and, and what they're well known for in terms of the different uh, materials that get mined out of the earth. So other alloying elements uh, added to strengthen copper uh, as well. All right, so now we get into the Iron Age, which uh, uh, the very first iron products uh, weren't really dug from the ground. They came from what we refer to as meteoric iron. So um, obviously as meteors fall and have that type of iron and they hit the earth, uh, they're not quite as common as the iron that we can actually dig out of the ore. But that was kind of the first thing that was discovered um, were these meteor, uh, these pieces of rock that had iron in them called meteor auric iron there, and it was very rare and highly prized. The first smelting of iron began around 1200 uh, BCE. So we took the iron ore, uh, they took charcoal and limestone, heated out all of that together to produce the iron metal. It uh, is more complex. Here's the thing that to remember about iron. It is definitely more complex than smelting copper. There are multiple steps needed, longer times, higher temperatures, difficulty to completely remove the slag. Now what we're talking about slag is uh, in modern terms is waste material. Um, or leftover stuff that is undesirable that we want to try to remove from the uh, molten material in the process that goes. But it's even today, we still follow multiple steps. Uh, we, we are capable of creating and having higher temperatures, and we are also uh, able to come remove slag a lot better than we were back at the during the Iron Age. So wrought iron. Uh, is the first development. So it was forged repeatedly to uh, drive out the slag. So uh, it would produce stringers of this iron called blooms. Uh, then they would use those blooms and forge them into different tools. So the thing that you want to remember about wrought iron is that it has a very low carbon content. Um, and that what they referred to are called bloomeries were the earliest furnaces for smelting iron ore. So bloomeries were among the first furnaces for smelting iron ore. All right, wrought iron versus true steel. Now let's talk about the uh, what is referred to and known as Damascus um, steel. So and that term Damascus kind of refers to a process that gets followed, obviously coming out of uh, the Middle East. Uh, areas um, when they first kind of developed this. So it was uh, produced by melting in small crucibles. And uh, this higher quality iron was able to become slag free. So the as they used the smaller crucibles to heat it up, there's longer 
time period to get to that heat. That slag floated to the surface. They were able to then kind of extract it and separate it from the metal. It gave us a much higher carbon content. Now, notice uh, that wrought iron has a low carbon content So uh, versus the true steel or what we refer to as Damascus steel, which has a higher carbon content. And that steel became stronger and is what we classify as the first true steel. Now, uh, the third form of iron was the was cast iron and we were using blast of air to increase this furnace uh, temperature and get that uh, metal hotter. So independently it was kind of discovered in Europe, Asia, Africa. I think the historians say it was all kind of discovered around the same time. Who knows uh, what information was passed between those different geographical regions. But it was cast into simple shapes that we called pig iron. Uh, notice that it contains 2 to 6% carbon. You get the increase of silicon and other elements into uh, cast iron as well, where you get a lower melting point. It makes the casting process easier. Uh, it's harder and more wear resistant than wrought iron, but at the same time, it is also very brittle. Now, uh, at this point, just to try to keep these lectures a little bit uh, more user friendly. I'm going to go ahead and stop the video right now. This will be the first video in the lecture here for chapter one. So I'll continue to make it so you can uh, shut this video off now and make sure that you watch part two of this lecture.